On this week's program, the Phenom 2 movie looks to create maximum carnage. Is the Saw series spiraling out of control? And it's time to return to the Mass Effect universe. All this and more as we reach our next stop, the PCC Multiverse. Don't be alarmed. The quasi-shimmering light before you is a trans-dimensional gateway to other worlds, other voices, other thoughts, and other realities. Up feels like down, and down feels like the number seven on a Wednesday morning. Don't worry. That quivering, blood-boiling sensation under your eyebrows is all a part of the charm. Welcome to the PCC Multiverse. And we're back with another episode of the PCC Multiverse. This is Gerald Glasser from Pop Culture Cosmos, Game Source, Inside Sports Fantasy Football, and the Lakers Fast Break. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our shows. And if you can, please give us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. Plus, if you can like, share, subscribe, follow, or do anything that you can to support us right here at Pop Culture Cosmos, it is sincerely appreciated. But it wouldn't be a PCC multiverse without my good friend. You can find him on the Twitter and Instagram at CastlePCC with a K. It is my good friend indeed. You got to check out what he's doing at CastlePCC on the Twitter and Instagram doing a lot of cool things that are out there, drone stuff, and so much more. It is my good friend. It is Marcus De La Garza. And Marcus... Great to have you back on the program one more time. One more time. I feel like sometimes you oversell my Twitter. I think it's mostly just snarky comments and me relaying stuff about my bad day. But I know how that's entertaining to a few folks. I, I do get text messages from my friends that are like, hey, uh, it looks like you had a bad day. You want to talk about it? Like, it looked pretty funny, though. Come on. Can you laugh about it yet? So, you know, it's like are... that old song. You had a bad day again. Oh, no. Yes. You had a bad day again. I should just like play clips of that for you. So. Yeah, but uh, honestly, I, I do enjoy my Twitterverse now. I am a little bit of a lurker, but... You do know, sometimes it's... I put on their cryptocurrency stuff, so there you I, go. I do, yeah. I, I don't publicly disclose my cryptocurrency stuff on, on air, but if... Uh, oh, but you, you wanna... comment on it. Oh, yeah. But uh, if you want to if you want to see how I really feel, go check out that Twitter. I'm not a financial advisor, though. There you go. Unless you make a ton of money and then you'll... Have a lot of people asking, hey, man, <laughs> can you be my financial advisor? You're right. like, uh, no, I only yeah. play one on TV. I went to a Holiday Inn last <laughs> night. But it is going to be a great show we have for you lined up today. A lot of talk, including a series that's well-known and well-beloved here in North America that is ending. Some people say way too soon. It's actually leaving at a high point in the series Plus, someone who's been in the talk show industry for over two decades with a show that has stood out during afternoon television is also leaving. So we'll talk about Ellen and This Is Us, both parting ways with their viewers coming up here in a little bit. Plus, we will be talking about the latest movie in the Saw series. It's kind of a Saw movie. It's kind of a police drama. But is it much more? We'll talk about Chris Rock's latest movie, Spiral, along with Samuel L. Jackson. Both of those great actors are in this movie, but did it make the movie great? We'll talk about that on the back end of the show as well. Plus, the wait is finally over for all you Mass Effect fans out there. Mass Effect Legendary Edition is here. If you're listening to us, if you're within earshot, Mass Effect Legendary Edition is out in the wild. It's available in retail stores and, of course, wherever you can download it online. And we are truly excited here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. I know a lot of people who have heard our shows over the years know Josh, and Marcus, and my love for Mass Effect. In fact, if you're watching video, you can see it directly behind me how much I've loved the series. So we will talk about the Mass Effect series, why it's so revered, where did it go wrong, and can this Legendary Edition connect with not only the old audience that originally played and enjoyed the series, but can it connect to a new audience, which is also just as important 
especially with a possible, as we've seen already in trailers and the sneak peek, that a new Mass Effect is on the way to get them excited into this galaxy of Mass Effect. So we'll talk about Mass Effect Legendary Edition and why this is not just your normal remake, your normal rehash, then they just put it out there. We're going to talk to you about why this game is so important and one of the biggest releases of 2021 coming up here in a bit as well. But first, my friend, it is Venom. Venom 2, although the official title is Venom, Let There Be Carnage, because it's going to incorporate, as people saw it, they saw the first movie and saw at the end credits, Woody Harrelson, who is going to be taking up the mantle of Carnage coming up here in this movie. Mm-hmm. It dropped, and of course, all the time on Mondays, right after our Pop Culture Cosmos you know, gets recorded and whatnot, they always drop a trailer right afterwards. And sure enough, they did. They dropped a trailer for this movie, Venom, Let There Be Carnage, which included a lot of things that are going on in Eddie Brock's life right now with the symbiote. You say symbiote, I say symbiote. So symbiote, right now, as they were living in San Francisco, where they're at now, and how the story is going to develop where Carnage will be taking liberties in New York City as well. So that could be a tie-in to what's coming up for Spider-Man, because eventually it all leads to Spider-Man in the Sony-verse. So I want to hear your thoughts first on the viewing the trailer itself. What were your impressions on it? And we can go from there. Yeah, watching the trailer, visually stunning. I thought they did a great job with what special effects were on screen for us. It feels like we're going a lot more tongue-in-cheek this time. Maybe that was just the attitude I was in at the time watching that trailer, but it did feel like we were kind of willing and able to to make fun of ourselves when we need to and, and also have those serious superhero moments. Oh, well, it looks like he's Eddie Brock, a.k.a. Tom Hardy, is just basically his character's given up any type of yeah. trying to escape the symbiote. And the symbiote has completely taken over his life. You could see it tried to make breakfast for him, and it was just like destroys the whole house in doing so. So oh, yeah. you it's, can see the, the funny part of it, at least. Yeah, and it makes for, I think that lighthearted humor is going to make for a great intro to this movie. It, it'll probably get off to a little bit of a quicker start just between those funny moments you have between the symbiote and Eddie Brock. But I really was kind of interested in this one. I, when I first heard about it, I thought this was just going to be another cash grab. I don't think it's going to be. You know, Sony loves the money just like everybody else does. I know, but I mean, we've got a little bit more of a Marvel controlling hand now, it feels like. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, and so, I mean, that alone, I think, is going to up the the writing and and production quality. Not to say it was terrible before. I'm just saying I I think it's going to be up at that Marvel standard again. I'm excited about this one, Gerald. I know it's a cash grab, but just watching the trailer, I was pretty interested in it. The fact that we've got Woody Harrelson and then Russell Crowe as well, I believe, early on in the trailer. No, I don't. I didn't see Russell Crowe. Ooh, okay. Well, you have to I, IMDb, IMDb that sucker, and let's see if that's the case. But I will say that there was some great footage that we did see in it when it comes to Let There Be Carnage. Because to me, it's something that the first movie I didn't think very highly of when I saw it. I just thought it was there. Uh, I didn't really think that it was going to get me and keep me interested in the series. The fact that it's all going to tie into our good friend Spider-Man is going to be something I think at when it does finally hit, I think everybody will then be excited for that. Right now, when we meet Spider-Man, we're going to be dealing with a lot of things with a multiverse with Spider-Man battling the forces from, you know, as we talked about Doc Ock and Alfred Molina spilling the beans and Jamie Foxx with Electro from his character in that series of Spider-Man. So he's going to be dealing with that. But then you see Venom bleeding over into this world of Spider-Man and its Spider-Verse because the action is going to take place eventually because it leads in, if you check out the, the trailer, it leads into some events that are going to be in and take place in New York City. And we all know who is in New York City in and around there right now, our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, I was incorrect. That's not Russell Crowe early on in that trailer. No, Russell Crowe's in another Marvel movie. He's playing Zeus as he, he already is. dropped the yes. Yeah. And and so I, I don't there's somebody early on in the trailer. It really caught my eye and I I, th- I really thought it was Russell Crowe first. Well second. there's something that may have caught your eye is they put in a little tie in dare I say, Easter egg for the Avengers in there, because I think there's someone that's reading a newspaper. 
And if you look on the inside, it has the word Avengers written on mm. it. So how it ties into what they're doing and all that is going to remain to be seen. I, I think there's always going to be a loose affiliation with this whole tie-in. I Like you talked about with Marvel and their influence in it, there's going to be this loose tie-in when it concerns all the other non-Spider-Man characters like Venom, Carnage, the whole Sinister Six, Mobius, all that, because there's a Mobius movie that's coming out early next year as well. So it's all going to have a loose affiliation with what's going on in the MCU and the Avengers and all that. Only Spider-Man, I think, is going to have a direct tie-in, although we could be wrong. By the time Avengers come out years from now, this could all be tied in as far as the Sony Spider-Verse and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So we're not even sure from there, but I like where it started, and I like the fact that it's dropping you little breadcrumbs every now and then that lets you know, you know what? The MCU is around somewhere. This is going to be a great film to watch. I, I think I'm with you. We are doing a great job of dropping these breadcrumbs. And honestly, you're really killing me. Not killing me. You're surprising me with these pop culture finds here. I really didn't catch the Avengers on the inside of that, that newspaper fold. Watch enough of those videos where they drop the stuff that says, oh, we got Easter eggs in here. And, and you know, mm. like, what can I say? Oh, I do my on. research. I do oh, try to do my no. research every night. You do a lot of research, I know, on a lot of other things for this show. So I do. Yeah, I, 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 do. I got you on this one. One time only. One time well, only. It always surprises me when you show up and you're like, oh, do you see this one thing? And it, it's like, Gerald, how would you even catch that, man? <laughs> I, I can't catch that the first time. I, I okay. usually catch it when somebody else does that's paid to do so a lot more than I am. But I will say that when it comes to the carnage that's going to be out there and possibly leading into carnage joining a sinister six, which is ultimately what I think that it's going to lead into. I think it's going to lead into a sinister six of some type battling against Spider-Man and maybe venom teaming up, or I don't know venom because he's an anti-hero. Maybe he'll side with the sinister six. I'm not sure at this point in time, but it's going to be something very interesting to see how carnage and venom face off in this particular movie. What are your thoughts on Woody Harrelson at this point in his career playing a character like this? And do you think he can pull it off? I mean, he's played a serial killer before back in the 90s and a movie that I worked on, Natural Born Killers. So I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility for me. I think he does play that kind of that psycho role just a little bit too well at times. And uh, I'm looking forward to see his portrayal of Carnage. I'll tell you what, watching the little bit of the trailer where we see the transformation really kind of sold me there and then you know you see carnage show up at the end of the trailer and and really kind of flex his muscles and he has the potential to be a a great carnage just a great villain and we'll see what what comes of it man i'm not a huge fan of woody harrelson's at times and then at other times it's like man this guy can really crush it i flip-flop on him so hard always yeah i've been a big fan since cheers because he wasn't on at the beginning he was replacement i believe for the elderly bartender who passed away on the series and then they brought him on as a replacement for that and he killed it if you got to watch the old episodes of cheers the ones with woody harrelson i think are some of the best that are out there that he's included on and of course you know with kelsey Grammer, he also came in there later on and he right. killed it and obviously you know what ha- happened to Blair frazier yeah. and the fact that it might be rebooted again in fact it will be rebooted again on a streaming platform coming in the not too distant future so seeing that how that evolves so many years later that remnants from cheers so long ago it's so funny how that even continues on yeah yeah after 40 years please so it's it's so yeah. funny how that's uh, well actually 40 about close to 40 years later so it, it's so funny how that's all played out carnage and the whole thing with the venom movie let there be carnage do you see venom reaping the kind of success that it did because it is one of the most successful r-rated films of all time it, in fact, it was, I think, at or near the top before Joker surpassed it. Do you see that type of success with it again? I mean, not considering number by number. And that's something that we have to go into. I can't say this movie is going to make 800 or $900 million. You have to go ahead in the current environment that we're in. And the fact that these movies will go to streaming services a lot sooner, that the crowds going to the theaters are not as prevalent because of the coronavirus and all that. that it would make a proportional amount. Do you think it will reap the kind of proportional success that 
if it were under normal circumstances, it would have made. I mean, do you think this could have been something that will take the series further and not become a flop? I'm hoping so. I mean, the one thing I did catch early on in the in the trailer, it said that this is going to be a theater exclusive, so there will not be a day and date for Venom 2. So, uh, you know, honestly, man, I, I think that that's kind of limiting, but at the same time, they're going to be reaping the benefits of that that deal they they made with Marvel. So whatever proportional you know profits they make, they're also going to be making money hand over fist on the backside because they're going to be getting all that extra money coming through. Uh, then eventually. it goes to Netflix, and yep. then after that, it probably it, won't go to Disney Plus because it's an R-rated film. The Sony's not. I don't think they're they're really hoping to make their money on the on the front side here at the box office. They're really hoping to make their money when this hits all these streaming platforms and and know that they're going to make all that residual. I'm with you. Absolutely. Always about the cashola, my friend. Always about the cashola. Back up that Brinks truck, baby. I mean, like, come on, let's go. I, I need go, that money. Let's <laughs> go. Yep, yep. The chunk of change, indeed. But once again, it is Venom 2, Let There Be Carnage. Although, take out the two. It's Venom, Let There Be Carnage coming up later this year. We're looking forward to seeing it. Finally, for me, the first time, because I've never been really excited about the Venom series. I didn't even get excited over the Venom movie, but. I'm actually kind of intrigued about Venom Let There Be Carnage and how it takes the Spider-Verse forward and where it takes it. Is Venom going to be that anti-hero that works with Spider-Man or against Spider-Man or maybe both? We'll have to wait and see. But what are your thoughts out there on the first real teaser for Venom Let There Be Carnage? Please share us your thoughts. PopCultureCosmos at Yahoo.com. Hey, this is Chad from Ghost Toasters, and you're listening to Pop Culture Cosmos Podcast. Check out what's been going on with the Pop Culture Cosmos Show and the PCC Multiverse. My last movie that I saw in the theaters was The Last Skywalker. I know, condolences to me. Wow, man. Right. I, I just had talked about that and I completely forgot that I saw that movie. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> is that, it doesn't speak great things about it, I suppose. That's the Pop Culture Cosmo Show. And the PCC Multiverse. Catch our shows on Worldwide Radio seven days a week and wherever you get your podcasts. Well, there's so much to cover on today's episode that we still haven't gotten to, so let's get to it right now, my friend. There was some major announcements as far as the networks here in the U.S., ABC, NBC, CBS, and and some others approving shows, some of them canceling shows. We heard a lot about uh, some stuff that got got the axe and some other stuff that got renewed that were people were excited about everything from like standbys like America home. I didn't even know the show was still on the air America's funniest home videos, shark tank. Those two were <laughs> renewed. There were some others that, that have also got renewed uh, on yep. each of these networks. A lot of the CBS shows were renewed and whatnot, but two of the shows that came across my eye, as far as getting the ax were for different reasons. One is This Is Us, which has been an extremely popular show since its debut on NBC five seasons ago. It's going to end after six seasons, maybe due to story reasons where it's all been played out, but I think it has a lot more life left in it. But I guess the stars, the showrunner, or creatively, they're saying that they're going to call it a day after six seasons, which is coming up next year. And also, Ellen has said that she is also going to discontinue her show. I think early next year, I think, was the end date from what I'm understanding, which I know after the controversy that was created earlier this year and late last year in regards to the Ellen DeGeneres show, that may not be the worst of ideas in regards to that because there's a lot of uh, backlash there. So I want to hear thoughts, my friend. First on This Is Us, even if you're not a big fan, you are aware of the show. You are yeah. aware of the kind of emotion that this drives. And in the days and ages where we have these streaming outlets taking all the news, taking all the ratings and viewers, it's rare that we talk about broadcast shows on broadcast television anymore that really have an impact with audiences. And I think This Is Us on NBC is one of those last few shows that does exactly that. Yeah, I mean, I remember when uh, This Is Us became that cultural phenomenon just a few years back, and it felt like everybody in the nation was watching it. You know, it, it really shot up with notoriety and popularity. 
I mean, I felt like everybody was talking about it. It really rose to popularity. It's got Dan Fogelman as a writer, producer, director, showrunner, um, all that, show stuff. Runner, all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. And I mean, just so for people that don't know, Fogelman is behind Tangled, Crazy Stupid Love, Cars. You know, he's done everything from This Is Us to there was a 2016 baseball drama series called Pitch he did as well. I actually yeah. haven't seen that one yet, but I'm sure you've got a review on it, don't you, Gerald? I only saw one episode. It was all right. I think it did, unfortunately, get me to sometime the end. I think that was on Fox, if I remember correctly. So this is us. This was something that they threw at a 10 o'clock time frame. They said, okay, there you go. It's yeah. going to be procedural drama. It's going to have these tie-ins to Milo Ventimiglia's character from the past and how the kids, I think they're all adopted, so whether they're all adopted how they're dealing with it today and how the bond that they have, even as adopted brothers and sisters, how they still have this great bond and they go through their lives, but still tie itself into Milo Ventimiglia's story way back when. So it's nice how they intertwine still these stories, even after they showed exactly what happened to him, how did he die? They already went into that seasons ago, but yet they still found fresh ways to show his character how he lived in the past and who he became before he met his untimely end. And yet it also intertwines the stories with what's going on now for the adopted brothers and sisters who are still making their way through, especially Sterling K. Brown does a sensational job on you. One of the finest actors on television. I cannot tell you what a great job this man does. I know he's done some stuff, Black Panther and some other things on the movie scene, but He really is a a high quality actor and they have a great cast. It's done obviously a great job. It's kept people invested and still earns high ratings. It still gets, you know, quite a bit, the, the show of the night ratings wise, you know, almost on a weekly basis or at least up there. So I want to hear your thoughts on the impact of this is us and why they could possibly be leaving now, because I'm assuming it's because of a creative issue and not because NBC wants it to happen. Well, all right, so at the end of season four, Fogelman was asked at at the finale party that if he had a plan for the rest of the show here, and I want to say it was that night specifically, he said, we're done after six seasons. That's all I've ever had planned for this show. So I think there's a little bit of that happening, and NBC and the stars themselves are just maybe unwilling to keep going with it but i'm i'm kind of with you there's a little bit of life left in this if we really wanted to you know keep making that money you could find a storyline for a season seven maybe a season eight season eight well you said that after season four ended right they had at the rap party that's what he said he envisioned six okay that means that there was a period of time between his statements then and what happened where they announced officially that's ending after season six this week Okay, I mean, they're still going to be doing season six and all that. But that tells me that NBC took about, what, a year or a few months, whatever. They took that time to go ahead and try to convince Fogelman to do whatever they can. They backed up the Brinks truck. They showed the (laughs) De Niro. They showed the chunk of change. They tried everything that they could to convince him to go ahead and change his mind. But obviously, they were not able to do that. But that just shows you how much NBC reveres this program and what it's done for their whole network. Because at the time it was released, I think NBC was either number two or three. And it was actually getting closer to number four as far as the overall network is concerned because they were lagging in the ratings. They are now, I believe, the number one network as they leave. Or I'm sorry, CBS took it back. But NBC was last year up to number one. And a lot of it rides on This Is Us. Yeah, and that's what makes me a little bit concerned about the health of NBC moving forward. You've got to start worrying about, you know, how is this going to play out for the rest of their intellectual property? Who's going to be their heavy lift? This Is Us has put the team on their back and, and really helped NBC become what it has been again i'm a little bit concerned about how nbc moves forward you know but i'm sure there's a plan there you can't just push off your biggest piece of intellectual property in late night television and just go you know man it's just it's bad business man well what they're going to do instead is they're going to throw another chicago story at you how about that oh come on not another chicago they're going to have a chicago week it's going to be chicago shows all week on nbc 
And on CBS, they're going to split it between half of them FBI something and half of them NCIS something. Okay, they're just it's going to be split like that. It's, that's because that's Are, seemingly. Can what we go back to Miami or to. something for one of these, and then go to San Francisco well, they, for another? They, well, and then, okay, oh, they went yeah. CSI Miami when CSI had three shows out there. You saw yeah. how that went. David Caruso with the glasses. Oh, I think you killed him. Oh, I think you killed him. Yeah. All right. That's great. Thanks, David, for showing up. You put the glasses on, have a snarky little comment and walk off. But that lasted a few seasons. So Yeah, he got paid twenty thousand dollars every yeah. time he did that, you know. But you can't, it, can't be upset about that. That's true. NCIS, <laughs> it leaves New Orleans. So cause that got canceled. But yeah, it now it goes to Hawaii. To you know? So NCIS Hawaii is coming up. Crime scene investigations is going to be returning at some point in time here in the not too distant future as it was announced. So looking forward to that. But David Caruso, I, I love showing that gift when everybody sees my, how bad I do after the first round of the NCAA tournament basketball wise, and they see I've already bombed my picks and I always go ahead and I show the gift <laughs> of him walking away from the blowing up car. And I said, yep, that was my bracket just blew up in there. But Need I digress on that? I will say This Is Us, a very momentous show. I'm not sure we talk about it much on this show, but it does have an emotional resonance with a lot of viewers. It was one of the highest rated shows for NBC, and at least after six seasons, and it will be sorely missed by millions of viewers all over the world. And I'm sure it's going to be replayed on Peacock forever, seemingly, at least there for quite some time. But before we head to the break, my friend, and our major discussion on Mass Effect, I do want to go ahead and say the Ellen DeGeneres show, or Ellen, as it's now called, she's leaving the daytime talk show market after, I think, next year, early next year, she's leaving. It's going to be about around 20 seasons, around 20 yeah, seasons. It's close. Yep. So, yeah. So I want to hear your thoughts. I mean, there has been some things that have gone on that have been momentous. I mean, Tom Cruise dancing on the couch cushion. I mean because he was so in love with Katie Holmes. I mean, that's how far it goes back. I mean, that was an iconic moment that was, it was captured on that show. And uh, there's been some interviews that have been very important. But all in all, I think the damage was done. And I think there was a bad taste in the mouth of viewers. I think there was a bad taste in the mouth, obviously, for her because of the controversy that was created. But I want to hear your thoughts on Ellen leaving her show after so many years. Yeah, it's sad to see her take off, but I think the reputation was tarnished beyond belief the end of last year, beginning of this year, when people found out how much of a personal terror she was to her staff on that show, which is unfortunate because she portrays such a generous, kind-hearted person on her show that you would think that that would be her persona in real life. And unfortunately, that doesn't appear like it was the case. And, you know, fortunately for her, she had all that personal goodwill reputation going on with every community around. And I think she was given a second chance. And unfortunately, uh, you know, that second chance she was given by the network didn't transform into an actual second chance with the uh, general populace. I do have to say, though, I mean, had a huge cultural impact th throughout the years. Just like you said, you know, you've got Tom Cruise dancing on the couch. You got all the Justin Timberlake performances throughout the years that he's done on her show. I feel like anytime he was debuting an album, he'd just show up to her show, sing, dance, and all of a sudden he'd sell a million copies. That's all he had to do. She's had a tremendous impact on the life of many of the people that have come in to be interviewed by her. And so it's, it's sad to see that kind of power walk out the door. But at the same time, when you're a bad person, sometimes you got to, you know, pay the price. I just think it's for the best. I think, you know, like I said, there's viewers have a bad taste. Everybody yeah. in this situation, it's like, okay. You cannot undo what was already done and repair all the damage that's already been created, no matter how much you try to dress it up and say you fixed it. There's been just too much drama backstage on it, and I think it's seeped out, and I think it's been so much into the common knowledge out there amongst the people. I think it's best right now to say, you know what, let's call it a day. Let Ellen go on into different ventures, maybe back into acting more, a little bit more, maybe going back on the comedy circuit where she originated. Let her go back and do other things, maybe other shows to develop, something like that. But I, I think it's for the best. I really do. Yeah, my only problem with her going back and doing you know, stand-up or something, the last Ellen stand-up, I'm trying to think of what it was. It was 2018. Ironically, it was called like Relatable or something. And it was the most unrelatable material I've, I've seen out of her ever. Um, she had a few jokes early on about, you know, haha, I'm a star, you know, like, look at me, I, I don't know how the common person works anymore. But after about five to seven minutes of that, and it, it was just the whole routine, it kind of turned me away from the entire stand up itself. So I hope that, you know, if she does make it back out on the road and start doing stand up, you know, she gets a lot closer to what she was 
because some of those mid 2000s standups were some of my favorites. Well, we'll see what happens. But again, the Ellen show is going off the air after almost two decades. And then, of course, This Is Us is also leaving as well. Two big, important shows, a part of broadcast television. And if you spend any time with them, hopefully you will find other things that are out there in the TV world or in the TV space or in the streaming space that'll take that up and give you that amount of enjoyment as well. But what are your thoughts out there on This Is Us and Ellen leaving the world of television? Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Well, coming up next, it's our deep dive into the galaxy of Mass Effect. With Mass Effect Legendary Edition coming out, what will this do, not only for the people who loved it like I do, but the people who will be getting into it? Will this garner a new generation of fans, and what are our hopes for this series going forward? We'll talk about that coming up right after the break. This is the PCC Multiverse. If you want to see the coolest action figure collections out there, the stuff that you played with as a kid, hear from industry insiders that made the toys that really, truly defined who we are, then you got to check out Season 1 of Action Figure Adventure. Check out Action Figure Adventure now, exclusively at Big Bad Toy Store. You'll get 10 episodes of awesome action figure fun. I guarantee if you grew up playing toys, you will love Action Figure Adventure. And we're back with the show. It's the PCC Multiverse. Once again, it's my good friend, Castle PCC, on the Twitter and Instagram, Marcus De La Garza, right here with me. It is Gerald Glassford coming right back at you here from the Pop Culture Cosmos. My friend, it is finally here. As you hear this, I will have already been in the parking lot at a Best Buy waiting for someone to hand me the copy of Mass Effect Legendary Edition. And I will have already waited overnight for the 15,000 minutes that's going to be my Xbox One loading up all the updates because that's how long it usually takes for Xbox Ones to load up updates. So I will already have that out of the way and I will be deep into the galaxy of Mass Effect. So I want to hear your thoughts. In a year that's been very dry of video game releases with Resident Evil Village coming out last week being one of the major releases of the year, this could very well end up being one of the biggest releases of the year, not only because of the fact that so many people like myself have such fond memories and they want to go ahead and delve into that galaxy once again, but there's a lot of people who have heard almost ad nauseum how wonderful this series is, how great this yep. series is, who never played it, who may have been too young at that time, who are now old enough to get into a series like this and get into this epic space drama, which I don't want to say originated a lot of things, but it helped popularize a series of gaming and a hybrid storytelling RPG that, to me, is second to none. Yeah, man. I actually, and can I give a little bit of history of my gameplay through the franchise for a second? Absolutely, Just, because yeah. I'm going to give a detailed synopsis of mine after you do. So we'll yeah, go I, ahead into that. Yeah, sorry. I, I know you asked me a, a real pointed question, but when I think about Mass Effect, I think about the very first time I played. My wife and I had been together for probably about a year and a half at that point, and her brothers, for my birthday, got me a copy of Mass Effect 3. And that was the first time I'd touched the franchise, and I was... So they hooked. got you ME3 first instead of ME1? They assumed I had already played ME1 and ME2, and unfortunately... You know what I happens when you, when you assume, but we yeah. won't go there. Yeah, no, but... I really enjoyed it, and I've gone back to play ME1 and ME2. Everyone knows me at this point. I'm a huge Expanse fan. I just like being in space. Put me in space. Let me fight some aliens. Let me do something, you know, I'll really over Elon the top. Musk. Oh, man. SpaceX. There you go. <sighs> yeah. Shout out to Elon with your ways of killing the, the cryptocurrency market. Thank you for doing that. I'm losing money every day because of you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Okay, back to Mass Effect, my friend. Yeah, sorry. But yeah, Mass Effect, though, dude, I really enjoyed ME3. We would play in the evenings and Jamie would kind of like watch me play and, and, and kind of be the backseat gamer. And it really was a lot of fun when we were first together and, and you know, spending evenings doing that kind of thing. So I do look back on, on ME3 very fondly. I tried to play Andromeda and unfortunately I just was busy at the time or fortunately I was busy at the time and never took 
that much of an interest in it. I'm looking forward to the remastered ME1. From the reviews that I was reading, it sounds like they've done a lot to clean up the original game engine to make it a lot more beautiful, you know, take advantage of that 4K HDR kind of situation. They streamlined uh, a lot of it too as well, as far as for a gameplay standpoint and also a loading aspect. A lot of stuff that's been worked on when it concerns Mass Effect, but all three games in general as well. They have put a lot into all three, but it, I mean, it sounds like a few of the reviews I was reading, they put a lot of time into ME1 just to try and bring it up on par with ME2, ME3 from a graphic standpoint and a loading standpoint, just overall user experience standpoint. And that to me speaks volumes. If you can put that kind of time in to really set the next generation of gamers for your franchise up to have the best experience that you can have, what you're doing is setting yourself up for success down the line. So I'm really looking forward to this having a massive impact on the gamer culture, you know, over the next year or two, and then eventually moving on to future titles. For me, it goes back to when I was running game stores and actually back even further than that to E3 2006. I think that's the first time they showcased the trailer for Mass Effect or what they had in design for Mass Effect. And then it came out in November of 2007 and all that year, all that summer, since the trailers for E3 2007 came out for it, I was showing that off and showcasing that inside my store because there are people, and that got people's interest. What is going on with Mass Effect? What is this Mass Effect? What's it all about? What's going on with it? And I just could tell from that time that this was going to be that space epic I was looking for, that original space adventure that I could customize and I could make my own. The decisions that I made would be something that for good or for bad would be something that I would have to deal with. And for a long time, they, they will stay with me. Who did I let live? Who did I let die? Who was I able to go ahead and save? Who was I able to, not to go ahead and save? How did it resonate with me as a player? And how was I able to go ahead and either save the galaxy or destroy it? There's so many different avenues of how this came out. And, It all started again in what I consider the best year for gaming ever, 2007. Sorry, Rob McCallum, but unfortunately your argument going back way back when, when we had a discussion on it, 2007 is the best year for gaming. And in a year that had so many different standouts, Uncharted, which I was also promoting heavily at that store, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, and so many others for not only the Xbox 360, the PS3, but the Wii. It was just a great time for video games at that point in time. And that game, even though it came out, like I said, right around the Black Friday time or right around the time for Thanksgiving and all that, it hit and resonated with the audience because of just the things you can do. Spend 40, 50, 60 hours in this galaxy and just create your own adventure. Everybody's adventure would be different in some way, shape, or form. And the fact that it tied into me2 mass effect 2 and your decisions that you made in mass effect 1 would go ahead and carry over into mass effect 2 that was unheard of as far as for anybody playing a video game before we never had that decisions that we made carry over from one game to the next and the decisions that you would make on the fly where it gave you the choices as far as your speech and dialogue on how you wanted to proceed forward and the decisions that you would make you know, you could choose one path or you could choose another. And it, to me, it was just such an incredible experience from the get-go. I truly appreciated and valued it. And then going into Mass Effect 2, which by all accounts is even better overall rated as a game. People think that was the highlight of the series. And you could go even further and expand further. They streamlined the gameplay even more and the RPG elements, even though they weren't as diverse as the first one, they're still there and they would still allow you to go ahead and do a lot of the same things. And the fact that you had to go ahead and get a ragtag crew of beings to help you fight this journey and all the way to the end made Mass Effect 2 that much more special and that whole adventure even more amazing. And then ME3 came out and... (laughs) Well, I mean, it started out amazing. The gameplay was even more fluid. Things were going well. And then that ending, which was so controversial to a lot of people. It just seemed like Bioware took that promise of you being able to carry your decisions from game to game to game. And ultimately, your decisions would end up 
either costing everything at the end or benefiting everything at the end for you saving the galaxy, it didn't quite come to pass. I mean, it, you know, your decisions fell into the next game, but only to a certain extent. And I think the rudimentary three or four choices that you were given, the hardline choices that you had to make were so regimented, a lot of people just really couldn't stand that. And that's why there was, at that time, is one of the first big internet backlashes. The first time a, a cancel culture in video game really happened. And the Better Business Bureau got involved in this one, if I exactly, remember Exactly, because yeah. so many complaints were made, and BioWare caved in and had to go ahead and make a DLC patch that allowed it to go ahead and give you a little bit better choices. But still, it was like putting a Band-Aid on a hemorrhaging wound. Now, personally, I don't think the ending is that bad. I think it's all right. But again, it didn't give you that full investment on the 100 hours plus that you gave it going into that completion of this game of the series of the trilogy so i thought that was a little bit disappointing but overall the experience from one to two to most of three was truly sensational and i truly valued it and that's why i'm going into it again now looking back on it i can go ahead and say i can play through it a lot more a lot more enjoyable because i know a lot of what to expect this time around but it's going to be a sensational time for me how many hours do you think you've gotten to the franchise, Gerald? I'd probably say around 100. Not quite what Oblivion is for me with Elder Scrolls, but I, I'm saying right right around the 100 mark. So. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I look back and, I mean, comparably, I think Destiny was my equal franchise as far as, like, my putting all my attention and care and time into it. And, I, you know, last time I played that, the entire franchise, I think I was probably at, like, 300, 350 hours of gameplay or something. Man. You know, most of that online, but it, it's just... Dude, the I think massive... Halo 2. Halo 2 is the number one game I've spent the most time on because I okay. spent years in succession playing every night the multiplayer, every single night. But oh. clocked in hours, it's a, over, I think, around 130-something for Elder Scrolls for Oblivion. And then wow. for the Mass Effect series, uh, in the hundreds. So where did the series go so right? Was that it could do so much for so many people, and that's why people have the love for it that they do today, and that's why so many people are so excited for it. But where did it go all wrong for EA and Bioware? Was that ending of Mass Effect Three and the controversy of it, and then a few years later, them wanting to get back into it with Mass Effect Andromeda, which doesn't take place in the same galaxy. It's a different adventure. And it's a different studio that was assigned to it than the normal Bioware studio that did the three previous Mass Effects. And as everybody knows, it suffered a lot of problems. It was very unfinished when it was released. A lot of graphical errors, a lot of ridiculing and spite online. And it earned a lot of bad ratings because of that. And people thought that killed the Mass Effect franchise. And for a while, it looked like it was going to. But I'm so happy that over the years, the stain that is Mass Effect Andromeda, it's kind of worn off and people have regained an enthusiasm for this once again. Yeah, for sure, man. Andromeda, just like I said a few minutes ago, it, it really wasn't something that captivated me. And I, I think a lot of it was, just like you said, the fact that it was just a standalone. It made it to where, you know, everything we've done in the past just didn't feel like it, it continued on. I did want to ask you, though, if you had to pick one, what are you going with, Joe? As far one as the, the game in the series? Yeah. Yep. I love one so much. But, I mean, do you love Two one because is... that was your introduction to it? Or yeah. do you love... Okay. And then also the ending of it is really classic. Two is sensational throughout. And two is the better made game. Two is definitely the high point of the series. I think if you had to put whatever gun that you would play in the game at me and say, which one you would you choose? I would probably say one, but two is really a better game overall. But one, just because like you said, it, I had that fascination. I yeah. didn't know what to expect around every turn. I didn't know what to expect going to every planet. I didn't know what I was going to get myself into as far as the storyline is concerned with the Protheans and the Geth and all that. You, you're introduced to all these different races there, and it's such an incredible experience. That, for me, I think gives it a little bit of the edge, even though, again, number two is the best of the trilogy overall. 
Yeah, and I wouldn't say I did myself a disservice, but you know, having not played ME1 in, in the moment in 2007, I think that I, I really kind of did myself a disservice, man. I mean, like I, I wasn't a part of the hype. I didn't have that feeling that everybody else was having at the same time. I really kind of missed out on it. Should have um, come to my store. I would have said, kid, come here. Let's watch that videos. Come here. Look <laughs> at the screen because I have them playing. What I did was I took all the videos. I would put them on the DVD. And then run them on the loop for about 30 minutes. So you would, would get you really? the trailers for all the games. You know, like you'd see Call of Duty Modern Warfare. Then you would see a whole bunch of Uncharted. I was kind of like favoriting Uncharted and Mass Effect even at that time. Because I could see the greatness from a mile away with those two series. I mean, for me, it was just something I would have... I, I got so many people into pre-ordering Mass Effect and Uncharted based off of my word and what I was showing them that had no idea about it before. So I can't say I blame you. I mean, you just didn't have the right introduction to it, but you can make up for that. My friend with mass effect legendary edition and relive that adventure all over again. i tell you what, we're going to hit the break right now. And when we come back, you and I are going to be talking about how important mass effect legendary edition is. And can it resonate with the new audience? So we'll talk about that coming up right after the break. This is the PCC Multiverse. If you need your video game fix, be sure to check out Retro City Games. Located in Town Square on Las Vegas Boulevard or in Henderson, Nevada, Retro City Games has the cure for all your video game vices. Retro games and games for current consoles, Nintendo, Sega, PlayStation, Xbox, and more. Retro City Games has all the staples from any library and some highly collectible offerings too. So pick up a few games today at Retro City Games in Town Square on Las Vegas Boulevard or in Henderson, Nevada. Retro City Games is your video game game metropolis and we're back to close out the show this is the pcc multiverse it's gerald coming right back at you here along with my good friend from the twitter and instagram mr castle pcc marcus de la garza we're still talking about mass effect legendary edition because it came out this weekend and we're so excited for it but this is one of the most important releases of 2021 for the video game industry why when it's just a remake when it's just an enhancement when it's something that came out already so many years back it's because that for electronic arts it's still a wait and see even though there's a new mass effect that's on the way that they've announced they could pull it if the numbers are bad for legendary edition if they do not see the type of interest in it they could pull it at any point so i want to hear your thoughts What does EA and Bioware need to do with this Mass Effect Legendary Edition to get not only our generation excited about it, that did or could have played the game back then, but a new generation excited enough for it to get into it, to buy it, and to hopefully get them enthused about a new Mass Effect that's on the way? Yeah, I think they've already done it, and a lot of it was doing the heavy lift of going back and, and remastering ME1 and and upgrading those resolutions and textures throughout the game to uh, bring it in line with today's standards. Although, if you still want to go ahead and wait 15 minutes in the elevator while it's loading, you can actually choose that option, just to let you know. Can you really, or are you just pulling, I believe, pulling I believe my leg? I believe you can. No, I, I don't oh, think no. I'm I, I think I, I did see that option. I think most of the remasters have that now, where you can have it the old way, or you can have it the new way, so... It's good. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'd much prefer the new way, but as, you know, of, I, as do I. Believe me, I've, I've yeah. waited enough time in that elevator. <laughs> you know, you've got what a hundred hours into the game. How many of yes. those hours are spent from just you know standing in the elevator? Ninety nine. <laughs> but yeah, I think they've done. They've taken the right first steps, and that was remastering ME one and getting people back into the door into the game that made them. The next big thing is going to be advertisement. You know, how do you market it to the younger generation and say, "Hey, you need to come get in on this on the ground floor because because they've all heard of it." They right, all they've all it. heard of it, and they've probably heard their aunts and uncles talk about playing Mass Effect when they were younger. So, you know, what they've done is they've capitalized on the upgrade of the resolution, the textures, everything like that. The next thing is advertisement. Really sell it to this younger generation. It's like, if you miss out now, you're going to be behind the eight ball when we start releasing ME4, or whatever the unreleased title is going to be, and then everything that comes thereafter. It feels like we're setting the stage for our own Mass Effect cinematic universe here you know it's it's like we're taking a page out of the marvel book we're starting the next phase of the me franchise here and so what it also could do is could gain more interest about a possible series or movie i know we talked about before on this show the what was it the instagram photo from henry cavill 
looking at a possible synopsis of what a video version of Mass Effect might be. He was looking at some notes that had all the description of some popular MV characters in that description. We, we've noted that it was about a month or two ago. Yep. And was, I forgot about that, actually. But nothing has been announced yet officially. So if Mass Effect Legendary comes out to great numbers, it's only going to get that excitement running for Mass Effect as far as not only for a new game in the series, but other ventures. Like, I mean, for me, this has screamed a movie. Legendary Films has had the rights to Mass Effect for eons. I don't know if they still do or how that works now, but they have it. Legendary had it. I don't know if they still have it, but they had it for so many years and they chose not to. Maybe they saw the price tag that would come along with it at a time, didn't think was worth it. Even in the early 2010s, a video game movie that that usually meant death at the box office. So they decided to, I mean, Halo, I mean, Halo's had a problem trying to become a thing. Now we're finally with this advent of streaming services, we're finally seeing a true Halo that will be coming to Paramount Plus. So hopefully that'll work out well there. But with Mass Effect, if it's really going to win over audiences now, and this is a legendary edition, which is an enhancement, which is a refurbishment, which is a redoing of what was done before. If that gets a lot of interest with new and younger audiences, this could bring the whole Mass Effect IP even to a higher level, not only for a new game, but a new movie or TV show as well. Yeah, so I just took a second to, to look this up. Legendary Pictures does still own the rights to Mass Effect, and it looks like they are firmly going to try and go after this movie. It's not official yet. and You know how that is. Until you see it announced, I'm not going to... Yeah, I'm with you. I understand that, but I, I think... Keeping it, all my fingers crossed. I think we've got a chance that this movie actually does get broken out and filmed. It feels like there's enough of a, a gamer culture around this one that you're going to make some money regardless of whether or not it's it has to resonate with a larger audience. And I think the fact that this is a space opera and a space epic, whether it's the male shepherd or the femme shepherd, the idea is that one central individual, along with a whole other array of various and interesting characters. That's one of the things. Shepherd to a lot of people is straight laced, okay, point blank. He's not that exciting. What's exciting to a lot of people that have played this game are the characters, the Asari, the Krogan, all the different characters that are in the game and their backstories that they created, who people have come to love and respect for so many years. I mean, there's so much aura you could tell and the lore and the background that's already been done on this game. It screams, screams a viable entertainment platform on a television or movie screen. Bioware, even with this game, if it does well and if it's rated well and it looks great, has still got a lot to prove because Mass Effect Andromeda was followed up by Anthem, which they were given all the time to work on and create. And that was a major failure. So I'm still nervous about where Bioware is going to go with the Mass Effect series. A lot of the people behind it are no longer there. So It's going to be a new, fresh Mass Effect, and I hope it will still be a good one that relies a lot on the lessons learned from the first three Mass Effect games. And I'm hoping that it will relive the aura that was Bioware and the reputation that it once had, because it doesn't have that right now. It doesn't, but I think we have the chance to get back there very quickly. And so I'm with you. I hope we do get back there as soon as possible, because it it is deserving of every ounce of respect that uh, we can give it. And on Monday's show, I will give you my initial thoughts on heading back into the galaxy of Mass Effect with Mass Effect Legendary Edition. If you are a fan of the series, or if you're looking to get into a space epic like very few others, I highly, highly, highly recommend Mass Effect Legendary Edition. You get that. And so you can experience why the Mass Effect series is one of the most beloved in video game history. What are your thoughts out there on Mass Effect Legendary Edition? Are you getting ready to get into this part of the galaxy? Or are you still looking for a reason why you should go ahead and invest your time in Mass Effect Legendary Edition? Share us your thoughts. PopCultureCosmos at Yahoo.com. But my friend, it's been a great episode talking Mass Effect. I love it when I can talk Mass Effect. I can talk about it for like a long time. 
And maybe we won't do that because we're thinking about doing some extra stuff for possible Patreon thing going forward. So maybe we'll be able to get into that. It's one of the many ideas we're tossing around. We've already recorded some footage already. So hopefully we will debut that in a Patreon time later on down the road. But my friend, it's been a great episode. I cannot thank you enough for joining me. But before we head on out, Spiral from the Saw series heads to the movie theaters this weekend. Unfortunately, even though I love Chris Rock as an actor, especially when he plays more serious roles, and Samuel L. Jackson, I've got a great affirmation for him. He's awesome in, in a lot of the movies that he's done, but he does a lot of, I'm here, I'm here for a few minutes in the movie, then I jet on out or I get my character gets killed off. He's going to be doing it again later on this year with a movie that was starring Maggie Q called The Protégé, because I already seen that in the trailer. Okay. And you saw that in Cell, where his character with John Cusack, he was only there for a little while. Samuel Jackson, he's like Teflon, so it doesn't matter. He can be in a ton of these movies that go straight to video or go straight to bomb or whatever. He'll still be okay, because <laughs> he's Samuel L. Jackson. But the movie itself, unfortunately, is not a continuation that's very well done in the Saw series. The movie is getting bad reviews. I know you had high hopes for it before you went on the air. I'm hoping you get a chance to get to see it and, and share some thoughts on it. But the Saw series, unlike the Conjuring series and some other horror series, which are still showing signs of life, this one is looking like it's spiraling out of control. Wow, that delivery there with that spiraling out of control, man. Really killing it. <laughs> Give yourself a little pat on the back for that one. Man. Trying to, trying to. Uh, before we went on air, I said, man, I, I love Chris Rock. I love Samuel Jackson. I was really interested to see how that chemistry played out for a horror movie. And unfortunately, he kind of burst my bubble there saying that the reviews are pretty terrible. And looking at them myself, I don't know if it's worth spending the time on other than just, you know, having the chance to check that one off the list and say, yeah, oh, I watched Spiral. You don't want to watch it. At the end of the day, I'll probably end up sneaking it in in about six months and, and watch it and, and add it to the library of movies. You did call it right, though. Sam Jackson as Teflon Don just shows up, gets paid. Doesn't matter if it's a tank, if it's a great movie. Moves Straight on to the video. Project. Doesn't matter. He, yeah, I mean, really doesn't matter. Yeah, because he's Samuel Jackson. I mean, Deep Blue Sea, he's only in a few minutes. He has a speech, gets eaten by a shark, and there you go. I mean, a lot of other movies he's shown up as the Hitman's Bodyguard. That was awful, but it's getting a sequel. So he's going to be in that one for how many minutes? But again, Samuel Jackson, he can do no wrong. Even if he's in a movie, that does a lot wrong. But it is Spiral from the Saw series, loosely tied in as a, I guess, an extension of that series. But unfortunately, it's not going off to a good start. What are your thoughts out there on Spiral? Please let us know. PopCultureCosmos at Yahoo.com. Coming up Monday on the Pop Culture Cosmos or wherever you're hearing this on our over 40 radio stations worldwide or wherever you get your podcasts, Josh Peterson and I will be back. We'll be talking about, again, my initial thoughts on Mass Effect Legendary Edition. We're going to go and do a deep dive into Resident Evil Village. Plus, we also want to talk the controversy with trading cards. Target and Walmart have made some very, very serious decisions about the future of trading cards, at least them carrying the stores. But the danger is there for trading card owners that are out there when it comes to Pokemon, sports cards, Magic the Gathering. You know what? My conversation in the past with Vince Otillo should have warned me and clued me in on it. I'm going to go ahead and touch on that interview that we had and why it's resonating now and the dangers of trading cards coming up on Monday as well. But my friend, it's been a great episode. I cannot thank you enough for being part of it once again. Any last thoughts on the way out? Just a couple things. 2007 was a heavy hitter for video games. Best year ever. I've got a few titles that I just want to list off here. The Orange Box, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, Halo 3, Uncharted, Forza That's Motorsport event. was actually kind of, you know, that was a big deal in, in my uh, world. And it's not just the fact that whether or not they sold a lot then, it's the influence they had to go ahead and be the benchmark for each respective series going forward. That's why I think it's the biggest year in gaming. And that's something we can talk about on another episode down the line as well. How about that? We can. And, and uh, you know, the thing I did want to point out is all those titles we just mentioned did not receive under a 90 on Metacritic. So, I mean, those were very well-reviewed titles. 
I mean, Call of Duty's still doing the same thing they did for Forza. It's still stuff. doing the same. <laughs> Uncharted's still doing the same. Yeah, and so now Mass I'm, Effect is doing the same. Assassin's Creed and the Hitman trilogy as well, also yeah. in 2007. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, great, great, great year for video games. That speaks a lot in volume, right there. We'll leave it at that. So, for Marcus De La Garza, this is Gerald Glassford. This is another beautiful day in paradise, right here in the PCC multiverse. We thank you for listening, and here's hoping. You have yourself a great.